Sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't leave. So lay down your burden, lay down your All who are broken, lift up your face, oh wonder home, you're not too far, lay down your head, lay down your heart, come as you are. at the table, come taste the grace, there's a rest for the weak, a rest that endures, earth has no sorrow, and heaven can endure. Lay down your burden, lay down your good to be here with you. Last week we had a wonderful Easter celebration, the resurrection of our Savior, and many of you noticed, you know, we asked our church family to, uh, to attend, push towards either the 7, 15, or the 11 o'clock because the 9 was going to be packed, and we did so so much that the 9 o'clock was not packed, and the 11 o'clock was extended out into the foyer and upstairs. Uh, and so uh, you guys do a great job of listening. It's fantastic. We're so proud. If you would, let's stand together and let's give God all the praises as we sing all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing hallelujah. Can we do that this morning, church? 
Wait a minute. Y'all are the later crowd. You should be awake by now. Can we do that this morning, church? Yeah. Amen. Let's praise him this morning. being seated, uh, our executive pastor, Bruce Campbell, is going to come and share a few words. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you. And uh, if you are in senior high, sitting in the audience, we had a little change since the students were with us during Easter. Um, normally, on the first Sunday of a month, we have the senior high students join us in this service. 
That's one of the reasons we have some of the uh, musicians from the senior high up here on stage today. But there's been a change, and so if you're a senior high student, they are meeting down in the uh, lower building there. So feel free to get up and join uh, your classmates if you would like to do that. Uh, and you know, I want to thank all of you. There are so many of you that served last week in various ways, whether you were in the choir, up helping out with music, you were in the audiovisual, a greeter, in the parking lot, security, I'm missing people, but there were a lot of people that helped, especially at this service, a number of people that weren't scheduled to help just help move chairs, and we're so appreciative of all that you did. You know, I think uh, to all of you that helped last week, just a real round of applause. It was a tremendous uh, Easter week. And thank you for the cards and the words of, of appreciation that you've expressed to everybody that was involved. We're so encouraged to get feedback uh, like that from last week where uh, Jim and Marcus did a tremendous job of explaining the gospel and Marcus, of course, sharing his, uh, his story of redemption. Well, if you're new with us uh, for the very first time, we're uh, really glad and delighted that you're with us. And same with those of you watching online for the first time, uh, we're glad you're joining. We know, in fact, that before anybody attends church today, they do check out the church online. So we're glad that you've checked us out. We've got 150 ladies at a ladies retreat this morning. So thus, it's a little thinner today in this service, and I, I didn't know when 150 ladies are gone, it's actually like 400 people gone, because their husbands stay home because they couldn't figure out how to put the diapers on, you know, and drive here, so our online streaming, streaming community is much larger today, and we're glad you're joining us. But if you are new for the first time here, there's a blue connect card like this one in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you would just take a minute to fill out the information on this before you leave today, We'd be very grateful. Just slip it in one of the offering boxes at the back, or you can drop it off at the welcome desk. You'll end up getting an invitation to lunch for some weeks in the future where we can get a chance to dialogue with you. You can ask questions about the fellowship, and we can get a chance to know you. And so we're uh, glad you're here. So at this time, I'd like to ask the elders to come out, and John Smith and Sue J. Phillips are going to be... Uh, I guess installed is the word we used onto the elder board officially. And as the elders are coming up, men, there is a men's summit coming up uh, just a couple of weeks. So go to the events tab on the website. You'll find all the detail information there. It'll be a great event. Eric? Thank you, Bruce. Hey, good morning. I, I'll tell you what, I, I love the, um, the women's retreat weekends. Uh, I think it's, it's so great. But I'll, I'll tell you what happened for me. I had eight children. We had four boys in five years. And I remember the first time my wife said, I want to go to the women's retreat. And I nearly uh, wanted to have a divorce. I mean, it was, I was terrified at the prospect of taking care of those, those guys. And I, I know I'm sure there's some beleaguered young men uh, raising uh, families and young children that are, are here today. So uh, my hat's off to you. Uh, this is a great day. We're excited to be here on this great spring day uh, to stand before you. Uh, with these men. The reason we're standing before you uh, is that the Bible uh, tells us, uh, Paul instructs in the book of Titus to appoint uh, elders in every city. And the idea of an elder is an under shepherd, Christ being the chief shepherd. And we believe that God raises up men for service, for leadership in his church. And, and uh, months ago, you may remember, we reached out to you, the congregation, to, and we put these fine looking men's pictures up uh, before you and said, if you have any comments about these men, we'd love to hear uh, feedback um, because we've been vetting these men and we, we believe these are men of God. Um, and we got so many overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive responses from each of you um, that the rest of us elders began to get insecure. Um, it, <laughs> Really, uh, just tons of, of really great things poured in, and so we're very thankful for the response. Um, and, and today, we just want to uh, recognize these men before you as, as uh, new elders here at Reston Bible Church. We're going to lay our hands on them and pray, but if you would, yes.
Before we pray, I want to say just a few things about these men. Not much, but I just want to say a few things. We, we've recognized that these are men that love God. They love God's word. They love the people of God. They love God's church. Um, as uh, Acts 6 says, men full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we find great confidence in presenting these men to you this morning. And we'd ask you to join with us as we pray over these men. And Jason, I'm going to ask you if you would lead us in prayer. Father, what a joy it is to be among your people this morning uh, and to install uh, these men, Father, as elders appointed uh, to lead and care uh, for the flock here at Reston Bible Church, Father. And we recognize that uh, this is not us, uh, not so much us appointing them, Father, as us recognizing the work that you have been doing in their lives. Um, and by extension, Father, their ministry and love and care for you. Uh, at work within our body, Father, and the many families and lives that have been touched by their service and ministry. And so, Father, we recognize that this is something that you are doing, uh, and we are simply a part of it. And, Father, we are grateful. We're grateful, uh, Lord, that you've not simply left your church uh, to flounder and figure things out for ourselves, but you've given us good, clear, biblical instruction through your word, uh, through the guidance and leading of your good Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we bow in submission this morning. Uh, recognizing the work that you have done in our lives and the lives of these men to bring them to this point uh, to serve as elders uh, at Reston Bible Church. And so, Father, we rejoice um, for them uh, in you and pray, Father, that you would receive much glory and honor uh, through their service in the days, months, and years to come. And we pray all of these things uh, in that good and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. To see men who are stepping forward in leadership, uh, and 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 what recognition as an elder is not saying is these men aren't perfect. None of us are perfect, but that they're ready and willing to step into a role of leadership of God's church, and so we are so grateful for them. And uh, if you would, let's stand together as we continue worshiping our Lord as we sing of the great grace of God. song that calls to my soul there is a friend that won't let me go and now dark is the stain that I cannot hide and I see your arms of love open wide I come just as I am I come just as I am Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. There is a hill where pardon.
I come just as I am. I come just as I am. Without hope, with no place to begin, your love made a way and let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, amen. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained, and my orphan heart was given. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. rejoiced as though heaven had
celebrate the freedom of God this morning, church. If you would, let's uh, bow for just a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed that we have been freed. Lord, that uh, as we follow you and set our sights upon you, God, the, the things of this world, as the old hymn says, as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the things of this world grow strangely dim. And those things that begin to shackle us and weigh us down that we think are so important begin to lose their grip and they fall away because we begin to see that our calling is to follow you, that our calling is to look more and more like your son. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are indeed free forever. Amen. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. We're so glad to have you here at Reston Bible Church. Today, we are starting a brand new series in the book of 1 Timothy. The total series is going to be about 10 weeks. In the midst of it, we're going to have a couple of interruptions. Uh, in May, I'll be heading to uh, Brazil to be part of the teaching team for a pastor's conference uh, along the Amazon River. You can pray for that. It's called the Jungle Pastor's Conference because all the pastors that are coming are from the jungle. And uh, so, again, overall, we're going to take it through uh, most of the next several months. And uh, I hope that you have a Bible with you. I want to really encourage you to do that, to bring your Bible, to follow along. We're going to be in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. Our primary focus is going to be uh, 3 through 11 or so. Let me give you a little bit of history. So you know that Paul went on three missionary journeys. He then took a journey to Rome where he ended up in jail, where he wrote the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The book of Acts really ends there. What we know is that he was released, kind of did what many call a fourth missionary journey. We don't have much documentation about what he did there. And then he was imprisoned again and ultimately martyred for his faith. During that season where he was out after this first imprisonment, during that free time, he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. And then when he was jailed again, he wrote the book of 2 Timothy, which is Paul's final writing in the New Testament. We believe that Timothy came to faith in Christ during the first missionary journey and then Paul picked him up as part of the team in the second missionary journey. We find that in Acts chapter 16 where it says, Paul came also to Derby and Lystra during the second missionary journey. A disciple was there named Timothy. So somehow along the way, he, became, he came to Christ and became a disciple. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And we know that, that Timothy became part of the team. He traveled with Paul and so forth and so on. We also know that Timothy was probably very young. We believe that he likely came to faith in Christ as a teenager. And along the way, grew in his faith. Paul routinely refers to him as my child in the faith, which typically refers to the spiritual connection, but I think there was also a generational reality there as well. We know that he was young, probably in his leadership in the book of, uh, in the Ephesian church in his 30s. And understand that 
that youth was not valued in the same way that youth is today. People didn't look for young leaders the way we tend to. People looked to seasoned leaders. And this is why Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love in faith and in purity. We believe that he was one of the pastors of the Ephesian church, because he was in some measure of authority. And a couple passages give us reference. One is in 1 Timothy 1.3. We'll be reading this in just a moment, but a little preview. It says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Stay there. Do your ministry there so that you may charge certain persons not to teach different doctrine. And that's going to be our primary focus today is this issue of false teaching. We also believe that he was in a pastoral role because of what Paul says to him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he says, preach the word, a direct command to Timothy, preach God's word. We don't typically command people to preach unless they're in a pastoral role. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all, with complete patience and teaching. So the theme of the entire series, we'll review this each week. The theme of the entire series is Paul's loving charge to the church. This letter is filled with instruction, basically because of some challenges. And here's the instruction for the Ephesian church, which then much of that then translates forward into the churches down the road, including for us here today as well. And the theme verse for the entire series will be found in 1 Timothy 1.5 which says the aim of our charge, the aim of all of our instruction, what we have to say to you is love. We want to do everything in love in spite of the fact that we're going to have some hard things to say. But the issues that we're going to talk about grow out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul is saying we're going to teach you some things. We're going to talk to you about how the church needs to operate. But we're going to do that in love with a foundation of a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. Now, the word for love is the word agape. It is that unconditional love that considers the best interest of others above our own. And so I'm going to do all of this in love for everyone's best interest in the Ephesian church. And we're going to do this out of a pure heart. So from the core of who we are, that word heart is the center, the locus of of a human being. And that uh, center, that core is a clean one. It's, It's bathed in Christ. It's purified in Christ. With a good conscience, which is really the mind, the moral accurate assessment of what it's right. So we're going to, so with a pure heart, a clean heart, We're going to give you some truth in love, and we're going to do that with some clear, moral, accurate assessment according to what's right in Christ, and also in our sincere faith. Jesus is our our center. We trust in him, and with a pure heart, a sound mind, and faith, we're going to give you the truth in love. My instruction then, and it grows out of a clean heart, a morally accurate assessment of what's right, and our trust in Jesus Christ. So we're going to read our passage for today, week one, if Paul's loving charge to the church is the overarching title, week one today is guarding sound doctrine. One of the things that's been true of the church from the very beginning, and it remains true today, is the efforts by the enemy to infuse false teaching into the church. The church is, it has always been, and it will always be under threat of teaching that is not biblically accurate. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about three things, three principles through this passage, and then move it forward to what does this mean to you and to me today? What should we be doing in this regard? 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 3. It says, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. 
Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Father, thank you for the book of 1 Timothy. Thank you that as Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, communicated to Timothy some foundational structures through this book about how the church should operate, responding in large measure to some issues, some concerns, some things that were happening in the church, including the concern for false teaching, knowing, Lord, that we can benefit as we understand what you were doing then, what this means for us today. Be with us, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. So three elements from this passage that, are, that we are wise to consider. As we look at what Paul was teaching Timothy by the power of the Holy Spirit, the first one is the importance of godly leadership. We see over and over and over again in life, as goes a leader, so goes those who follow that leader. Therefore, we should choose our leaders carefully. We should choose those who we allow to speak into our lives with great caution and concern. Paul says in verse 3, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. He again, again in verse 6 refers to certain persons, again using that same phrase, by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion. Now, we're very confident that the certain persons that he was talking about were relatively few in number, but they were leaders. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because in verse 7, it says that they presume to be teachers. The reality is that in this time in history, the only people that were teachers were people who were leaders. It's not like today where we, you know, we have experts, but then we have people who have a blog who are teachers. And I often say, you know, in today's world, any idiot with a blog stands on the same footing as professionals or trained people in a given area, and it should not be so. Be careful who you allow to be leaders, who have a voice into your life. Paul goes on in verse 20 of this chapter to personally talk about how he removed Hymenaeus and Alexander from, the, from among them. We would have thought that if they were just a standard and average person who's getting off track, that the leaders of the church could handle that. But it was such that Paul felt the need to personally intervene in the Ephesian church by removing these men, which leads us to believe that they were leaders. Paul also tells us in chapter 3, a long discourse on what it means, the qualifications for what we're referring to as elders and deacons, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But the leadership of your church, he gives an, an extensive coverage. Well, why did he do that? Well, because there were problems in leadership. That's why he, why he did it. Recently, I was talking to a friend here from Reston Bible, who has a relative who lives in another part of the country. Grew up in the same family, grew up in the same solid church experience, so forth and so on. For the last several years has been going to a church with a, what you would think would be a solid pastor from a solid, well-known evangelical seminary here in America. Only to discover that this relative now, and you can see that it's been happening over time, says, well, you know, we no longer believe in hell. And we believe that Jesus died for everyone. Well, what they mean by that is that Jesus' death is effective for everyone. Jesus died for the world. Well, we believe that, but we believe that it's only effective for the people who actually embrace it. It's not effective for people who don't embrace the death of Jesus on the cross. This is, this is false teaching. And this friend of mine is shocked at how, how did this slide happen? How did this slippage move occur right under everybody's noses without... Detecting it sooner. There's a singing group from the late 70s into the 80s called Pearl Harbor and the Explosions. Anybody you've ever heard of the Pearl Harbor? Literally no one. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, they came out with a song <clears throat> in that time period called Don't Follow Me, I'm Lost Too. And I feel like that there's a lot of people in our world today 
out on the internet and everywhere else who we should consider their life verse, if you will, to be, don't follow me, I'm lost too. We need to follow people who aren't lost. People who are grounded biblically. And I just want to tell you that this church, Reston Bible Church, takes leadership very seriously. Takes the process of assessing leaders the gyrations of going through the assessment process, digging into history, doing what we need to do, asking hard questions so that you can be assured that the people who lead this church at every level are people who have been vetted, who are godly, who aren't perfect, who when they need to own their stuff, they do. When they need, we need to have hard conversations that we do. So that at the end of the day, this church honors Christ because of the commitment to the word. And that godly leadership is our, the foundation of everything we do built on Jesus Christ. Number one, Paul is telling Timothy that in guarding sound doctrine, we need godly leaders. Number two. Guarding sound doctrine rests on godly leadership. It also rests on the importance of biblical teaching. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this particular point to illustrate the significance of it and what's happening in our world today. He tells, tells us in verse 3, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. And that phrase means, in the Greek, it says literally, of a different kind to teach of a different kind, other than what you've heard from us, other than the apostolic truth that we are giving to you, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Now let me just say, all people have the right to believe whatever they want to believe. You can believe whatever you want. My challenge to you, though, is are you pursuing truth? We must suspend with the foolhardy notion in our world today that you can have a truth and that I can have a truth and that they can be different and that somehow they're both true. That's just fallacious in every area of life, including spiritually. The question then is, what's true? The pursuit of truth should be your effort, my effort, and the effort of every single human being on the planet. What is true? We may disagree on what's true, you may believe one thing and I may believe another. And at the end of the day, one of us is right. And we can both believe that I'm the, that one and you're wrong and vice versa. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree. But we can't both be right. And this notion is throughout the entire New Testament. John, in John chapter 8, speaks of Jesus being the truth, when he says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, Jesus claimed to have the corner on the market on what is true. You are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There is freedom in truth, whether it's a hard truth, whether it's a truth that I like or a truth that I love, all truth brings freedom in life. And is worthy of pursuit. John again, but this time in 1 John, to those who were being infiltrated by false teachers, says, I write these things to you. What things? That whole book of 1 John. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And may I submit to you today, it's important for every single one of us to come to grips with the reality that our enemy is trying to deceive every single one of us every single day. In Colossians, and we preached on this passage in our Colossians series a couple of years ago, chapter 2, verse 8 says, says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human traditions, according to the elemental principles of this world, and not according to Christ. And this is happening all over in churches across America today. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders, the same men that Timothy is involved with right now in this 
epistle of 1 Timothy, the same group that's leading the Ephesian church. This is what he says to them in the book of Acts, chapter 20. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to your flock, Ephesian elders, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And apparently it was happening because now he writes 1 Timothy later down the road. And then in 2 Timothy, his, again, his final letter, following up once again with Timothy in his journey with the Ephesian church, he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The reality is that today in our mix and match world where people kind of make it up as they go along, we have people looking for teachers to scratch, tickle their itching ears. What I've said in the past is that when I met Jesus 47 years ago, the world was very different. People saw truth as external to them. I believe this. I am a that. I am a Jew. I am a Muslim. I am a Catholic. Whatever it is. Which means that there's a set of truth claims. And as I scan the horizon of truth claims, I embrace this one. That's not what we do today. And back then, people stayed in their lane. I'm a Baptist. I'm a charismatic. The Baptist says, I don't know what they're doing down there. I'm not a charismatic. I'm a Baptist. I just do what my pastor tells me. Now today, people don't stay in their lane. As a matter of fact, the swim lanes are all but obliterated. It's just kind of one big pool and people pick and choose what they want to believe according to how they feel about it. And they listen to this pastor online because it makes them feel good. Can I just tell you the Bible doesn't exist to make you feel good? It exists to tell you the truth. And sometimes it feels good and sometimes it doesn't. The study of understanding how to interpret the Bible is a fancy theological seminary word called hermeneutics. And it simply means the theory and methodology of interpretation. What principles do we bring to the table about how to study the Bible? And can I tell you that just understanding the use of basic language is critical. People do all sorts of crazy, bizarre things with the Bible that they don't do with any other books. And let me tell you what I mean by that. People take, people ask the question, well, do you take the Bible literally? Well, I do. I take it literally as language is intended to be used. And sometimes in the Bible, there's metaphor and hyperbole and all kinds of things, and we should take them as such. So let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, And if your right hand causes you to sin, Jesus says, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. All right, everybody raise the right hand. Raise your right hand. Okay, don't tell me that your right hand has never sinned. I'm serious. At some point in your life, your right hand has done something sinful in your journey. Why do you all still have your why do you, Why do you have those? I mean, don't you take the Bible literally? Jesus said, if it sins, it causes you to sin, cut it off. And you didn't do it. Because we understand in language, sometimes hyperbole is used to prove our point. And we should read the Bible with effective skills of interpreting. Jesus said, I am the light in John 9. Is he really a light? Jesus said, I am the door in John 10. Is Jesus a door? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. No, he wasn't. He was a carpenter. What does he mean by that? 
Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. You don't look much like branches to me today. In John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread, the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Oh, but it gets worse. He takes it further. A few verses later in verse 56, he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. What? What is he talking about? And in this very passage, there were those who were like, they were freaked out. They were, and they no longer followed him, the Bible says, because they're like, what is he saying? Because they didn't understand hyperbole and metaphor either, apparently. Because just a few verses later, he clarifies everything that he's saying. He says in verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken, everything that I've just said to you about all this flesh business, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Did Jesus really mean that we ought to consume his flesh? No. What he was saying was that just like bread is basic for life, I am basic for the meeting of your every need, especially your spiritual need. You know, I have two dogs, Manning and Misty. Manning is our puppy. He's on the right. He's hysterical. He's nine pounds of ferociousness. He'll attack any other dog that he sees to his own detriment. You're like, what are you doing? And he's about a year and a half old. And then there's Misty. She's on the left. She is uh, pushing 15 now. And you say, what is wrong with her legs? She always stands in first position, uh, if you know your ballet. And uh, when we go out for a walk, Manning is always up ahead trying to mark his territory with anything that's vertical, if you know what I'm saying. And then Misty is, I'm always walking like this because she's sniffing every blade of grass along the way, literally. Now, if I had ever the opportunity or the privilege to write something that was recorded and permanently documented in something like the Bible, and then it was picked up 2,000 years from now, and in the story it said, and I walked my two dogs, and the one literally stopped to sniff every blade of grass. There would be those, because it's in the Bible, who would say somehow, miraculously, that dog sniffed every blade of grass because he even used the word literally in there. And then smart, educated people who understand how to use language would know that the dog literally had to sniff every blade of grass meant that walking this dog took forever as she just took in the world. And no more than that. Do you understand what I'm saying? About how we approach the Bible differently than any other literature because somehow everything we read is supposed to be magical. It's supernatural for sure. But it doesn't defy the laws of biblical evaluation and study. The word for this, excuse me, let me I, want to, I want to show you another, share with you another illustration that takes it a little bit deeper. In Proverbs 18.21, there's a verse that says, the tongue has the power of life and death. What kind of literature is Proverbs? It's wisdom poetry is what it is. Wisdom poetry. And this is a true story. No names and I've hesitated to share it because it grows out of this church. Several years ago, there was a prominent couple in the church with no small amount of influence who had been in the church for several decades. And by all accounts, were solid biblically and had been for decades. I sent out a devotional 
with this verse, the tongue has the power of life and death. And I received an email back thanking me for addressing this issue and so forth. And as the email dialogue continued to develop, I realized that something was terribly, terribly wrong. What I came to discover is that this couple believed in something that is very aberrant, in that our words are creative like God's words create. In other words, our words don't just have influences, which is what this verse means. They actually create. And so there was a young woman who has a severely autistic child. And this couple taught this woman that her child was severely autistic because she spoke fear during the nine months of her pregnancy. In other words, this woman caused her child through speaking fear to be severely disabled because of this, because of a, a misunderstanding, a faulty interpretation of this verse. That our words have that level of power just like God's. You see, I believe that under the leadership and the teaching of Reston Bible Church, we are largely a safe place to learn and study the truth of God's word accurately. But there is no church that is immune. No church that is immune to the infiltration of false teaching that causes great harm. Great harm. Michael Horton, a theologian, out of Philadelphia says the most dangerous place for a Christian today is in an evangelical Bible study where everyone sits around and says what they think the scripture means. You don't sit in your Bible study and read the scripture and go, what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to you? It is irrelevant what it means to you. It is irrelevant. What's relevant is what it meant to the writer through the power of the Holy Spirit to the reader. That's what we need to understand and then once we understand what God intended to say to these people through this writer, then we can discern what does it mean to me today. But if I read the Bible with complete disregard as to what God intended to say to a group of people through a particular person, I have no idea how to apply that to my life today. And I should tremble at the idea of even thinking about doing that without an understanding of what it meant the, the journey of doing this is what we call exegesis. It's the critical explanation or analysis of a text. The critical explanation or analysis of a text. We understand the culture. We understand some things about language. We so forth and so on. What we do today is what a pastor here at RBC refers to as narcissus. We take our narcissistic self-centeredness and we read into the scripture what we want it to say for me today. This is wrong. This is dangerous. And this is why tonight, back here in this room, at 6.30, we have invited Elisa Childers, who is the speaker for our women's retreat, to come back. Elisa has a fascinating journey growing up in the church, and suddenly she found herself in a church that was once very conservative, biblically, theologically, that started moving in the direction of what we call progressive Christianity and deconstructionism. And you say, I'm not sure I know what those words mean. No, you, you, you see this. You just maybe don't have words to attribute to, to it. But one of the most dangerous processes in the church today is this journey of progressive Christianity and deconstructionism. And I want to urge you to come back tonight and hear about her journey. She's written three books on the topic, and she and I are gonna sit up here and I'm gonna interview her about her journey in discovering how did this happen? What do you see? How do we see it today? What should we be looking for? So that we are not deceived in our world today. In the first century, they were falling off uh, Paul tells Timothy into myths and genealogies, and we have a lot of myths and genealogies in this type of thing today. We can get into numerology if you look at this and you take the, 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 the numerical character for the Hebrew word and you put it all together and so forth and so on. Voila, you have all these insights into the scripture. Oh my gosh, what, is the, what does the eclipse mean tomorrow? Is this the end times? No, it's an eclipse. <laughs> and what about the blood moon that's coming? I, you know what? 
we need to not immerse ourselves in all these astrological movements and that, that when, thing, when this uh, uh, sign comes under that sign and so forth and so on, uh, the, all the tumblers are going to fall into place and the, the truth is going to be unlocked. No, 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 no. The truth is unlocked. It's right here. It's right here. In Titus, Paul again says, Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Verse 6 of our passage for today says, Certain persons, by swerving from them, have wandered away into vain discussions. In talking about the church, in talking about his instruction to the church, this passage is about guarding sound doctrine. The first element is the importance of godly leadership. The second is the importance of biblical teaching. And then in verses 8 through 11, Paul talks about understanding the place of the law. The law has a place in helping us understand godly, sound, biblical teaching and keeping away from unsound doctrine. We need to understand the place of the law. Verses 8 and 9, it says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Law is a good thing. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. If we are saved, it's important for us to understand that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Okay? We are not under the law. However, that doesn't mean the law means nothing. It doesn't mean that the law means nothing. We get some clarity in other passages of scripture. Galatians 3 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written by the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. If you want to use the law as your criteria for gaining salvation, have at it. You just need to abide by it perfectly. Good luck with that. We aren't under that. We're under faith in Christ. However, the law has enormous value. Well, how? Well, Romans 6 tells us. It says, shall we, what shall we say then related to this faith and works thing? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. I'm saved by grace. But that doesn't mean I get to go out and do whatever I want. The law is there to guide and lead me to understand God's heart, his design for life, and to not violate his law. Not because it has anything to do with my salvation, but what we understand is that when we follow God's law, we honor him and life just goes better for us and between us and all around us and everything else. Understand that our world has always been sinful. However, places, countries, environments, cultures that have embraced the principles of God's law function better. Whether a Christian nation or not, we're not going to argue whether oh, we're not going to argue whether America was ever a Christian nation or not. In the fall, we're going to do a series on Christ and culture. And we're going to jump into all that. I'm going to talk about America, its founding. We're going to talk about Christian, non-Christian, Christian nationalism, whether you should vote, all those kinds of things. But we cannot deny that because there was a day when every courtroom in America had the Ten Commandments on the wall, that America functioned more effectively as a culture. Don't do that. How are we now? Sorry about that. So understand that the law has enormous value. Enormous value. When we don't follow the law, Paul says, all sorts of really bad things happen. And it doesn't take long to look into your news feed to discover that the disregarding of God's law is creating havoc in our nation today. 
And if you read through, as we're going to do now, the remainder of this passage, you see the reflection of the Ten Commandments in many of the things that Paul is saying. He says in verse 9 that the law is for the unholy and the profane. That helps us look at commandments 1, 2, and 3 about how we relate to God. For those who strike their father and mothers, that's commandment 5 about honoring your father and mother. For murderers, well, that's commandment number 6 about murder. For the sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality, that's commandment number 7 related to the sanctity of marriage and sex and marriage. For enslavers, which relates directly to the issue of stealing. It tells us not to steal. And enslavers, this word here, is man-stealing. It's stealing people for your own slavery and use. Liars and perjurers, that's a reflection of commandment number nine, which is not to bear false witness, to not speak untruthfully. God's laws are designed not simply to restrict, but to guard to guard us from that which, number one, offends him, number two, that harms ourselves, and number three, that harms others. That's what God's law is for. And that's how we use it today as people who follow Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm going to give you some instruction. It's going to be in love. It's going to come out of a pure heart and a sound mind and a faith in Christ. And the first thing that I need to instruct you about is guarding against false teaching. And as we do that, we need to recognize the importance of godly leadership, of biblical teaching, and a proper use of God's law to maintain order in the church and understanding what God has for us. And you say, wow, thank you, Pastor. Good job unpacking that passage. What difference does it make for me today? Let's talk about that in our remaining time. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, I believe Paul encourages Timothy and us with how we should consider what we've learned today as we walk out of the doors into this week. It says this. It says, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The phrase, do your best, means to show keen interest, intense desire, or impatient expectancy. We should be approaching the word with an effort to study it. Not just read it devotionally, although that's fine, but to lean in, to dig in a little bit more on a regular basis. To go, what does this mean? So that I can understand more effectively, what does this mean for me? The word for approved is after testing. In other words, we all study for the test and then we take the test and we are approved about what we have learned and studied. In life, we are tested to see how we have learned, how we implement the things of the scriptures. And what Paul is telling Timothy is that every single one of us should be intense students of the scriptures so that we know what it says so that we can live what it says and resist the tendency that we all have in every generation to get off track. You know, there's a myriad of things that you can do, and I'm going to just encourage you with a few things as we get ready to head into communion. And communion today is really, Lord, God, help me. Help me as a follower of Jesus and my allegiance with you to take seriously the importance in my own life to be an approved student through the power of your Holy Spirit, of the Word of God. I would encourage you to get a good study Bible. I typically preach out of the ESV study, uh, ESV study Bible, and when you get a study Bible, I would encourage you, read the introduction to the book. Read about who, the author. Read about the writer. Read about the location. Read about the issues, the themes that, are, that you're about to engage in this book. When you're reading through the chapter and there's little notes at the bottom, read those. When it gives you an encouragement to, to go to another book because there's a related verse that, that is connected to that, go take the time to go there. I believe that every follower of Christ should have a good study Bible to use in their own journey. Number two, get a good concordance. A concordance basically has recording of all the words in the Bible and where they're found. So if you want to look, do a study on the word love, Look up the word love in the concordance and it gives you all the verses about the word love. You want to study peace? 
Whatever it is, you can look that up. You, you can't remember where a verse is, but you know that there's a given word in the verse. Use your concordance to find it and then find that verse. The Blue Letter Bible org is one of the best resources for those who do not have a seminary education. You can even dig into the Greek. You can find some, some uh, commentaries. You can see it, what's called an interlinear, where the Greek and the English are kind of side by side across. You can get this, the nuance of some of that. You yourself, as a, even as a brand new believer, can begin to study God's word in greater depth through tools like the Blue Letter Bible. I've often recommended gotquestions.org. I'll tell you a funny story. The other day I was in the gym and there was a young guy there from Algeria. He's a Muslim. And he just looks over at me and just kind of out of the blue, he said, so what is all this big deal about the red heifer? Anybody been following the red heifer stuff in the, in the news? Anybody? Okay, five of you. Awesome. Okay, just can you go look up the red heifer, please? It's a big thing going on right now. There were these five red heifers that came from Texas. They're now over in Israel, and you need to have the ashes of a red heifer to ceremonially purify priests and so forth and so on. This whole discussion about the third temple and all that. You should know this is happening. My Muslim friend does. Okay. So he looks at me and he just says, here's a Muslim guy who says, what's this deal about the red heifer? Which is a Jewish thing. I hear that they're going to have to destroy the Dome of the Rock to rebuild the temple. I'm like, oh yeah, here's a conversation. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know what? I probably should brush up a little bit on the red heifer myself. Gotquestions.org, red heifer, full page on the Old Testament, what the, what, how the red heifer was used and why, what the projection is moving forward in prophecy related to the red heifer. It was everything I needed to know in brief right then and there to be able to have a meaningful conversation with Mohammed, that's his name, about the red heifer and the future temple and so forth. Fascinating, fascinating. It's a great tool. Last but not least, certainly, I want to encourage you to take advantage of the classes that we have here at Reston Bible Church called Equipping the Saints. Equipping the Saints. You want to learn the basics of the faith, what the foundation is of what we believe? We have a class for that. You want to understand how to study the Bible on your own so that when you, the principles that we just talked about related to hermeneutics and exegesis and those fancy words, how to approach the Bible so that when you study it, you land in a good place and you're pretty, pretty confident that what you understand it to mean is actually what it means? Take how to study the Bible, and we'll help you do that. You owe it to you, and you owe it to all of us. When we are all educated effectively, we are better together in standing against false teaching in the world that is taking over church after church, and people in your life who are getting all weird and theologically squishy because they're taking teaching from all sorts of measure of people across the internet and creating a mix and match belief system that really at the end of the day doesn't make any sense and it's certainly not based on anything that's true. And the better educated we are, the better we all are to understand what's true because truth should be our ultimate pursuit. Is it yours? Have you pursued the truth in Jesus Christ? Because the most foundational truth is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, then everything we've said today is secondary. <laughs> but when you commit your life to Jesus Christ, that very first important truth, that I am a sinner, that I need salvation, that I cannot stand before God in my own merit, and that Jesus died on the cross in my place so that I could have a relationship with him in eternal life. When I've sealed that deal, then the journey forward is everything about what we've talked about today. So that what you're moving forward in and believing in and all the different doctrines of the faith, all the different teachings of the Bible, you can believe are solid and founded in truth. I'm going to pray. I'm going to encourage each of you who perhaps haven't given your life to Christ to do that. And then we're going to go into communion. And what I want to do is ask you to take a moment to just kind of ponder what we've talked about today. That you might recommit as a follower of Jesus Christ to the truth in your journey. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the chance to be together today. 
I thank you, Lord, for every person here. And Father, I pray for anyone in our midst who is not a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, they've never taken the opportunity, maybe they've never even understood that they need to, to acknowledge that they're a sinner, to repent of their sin and their own efforts to gain any kind of justification, to recognize that in you and you alone we find our salvation, and that, Lord, you you give us everything that we need for life in this life and the next. Father, I pray for any that are willing to do that today. And as a brand new believer, invite them to participate in communion as a follower of Christ for the first time. Lord Jesus, you gave us the bread and the cup to represent your body and blood broken and shed for us that we might walk with you. And Father, I pray, God, that you would help us to walk in the truth not just in the truth of our salvation, but in the truth of everything else in your scriptures that guide us in this life. I just want to ask you to take a moment to do a little business with the Lord and talk to him about this whole discussion from today. Go ahead and talk to the Lord for a moment. Lord Jesus, we are thankful that that you are willing to have your body broken for us. And Lord, every time we take communion, we declare that we are in alignment with you and your truth and that you are the truth and that you have the corner on the market on truth. Not us, but you. And we only declare the truth as we see it in your word. Father, help us to recommit to you and to the truth and all that that means for our daily living. Lord, thank you for breaking your body for us. Let's participate in the bread together. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus Christ's blood is the once for all sacrifice for all of humankind. That's the truth. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our sacrifice. Let's participate in the cup together. Father, we pray your blessing on us. Thank you for this new series. We pray that you teach us, instruct us. God, may we honor you in all that we do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this chance to be together today. We pray all these things in your great name. Amen. Well, church, let's stand together as we close and celebrate the mercy of God. What love could remember no wrongs we Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morning. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly wrong? What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, 
If you, uh, if you get a chance, be here tonight, as Pastor Jim mentioned, as we have Elisa Childers come. If you are wondering, where is that intersection that's happening in our culture between culture and doctrine and the Bible, and where is all of this kind of shaking out, you will not want to miss this conversation tonight that is taking place. So we encourage you to be here. It begins at 630, uh, and it's going to be a wonderful time. May God bless you on your day and have a wonderful afternoon.